All righty. Yeah, preach the word. Amen. Nehemiah chapter 1 there, and uh, <clears throat> we preached through chapter 1 last week. This week we're going to hit chapter 2, and we're just kind of in a way of review this morning on this. Let me just say to you, Nehemiah is a tremendous book. It's a great book for any area of life, Christian life, that you want to look at. And, uh, but last week we talked about several things. We talked about that he understood that he, uh, the, the place that he was in was in captivity. It's a picture of a person being bound by this world and the influences of this world from doing what God would have you to do. It's a picture of being lost. You're getting captive to sin. And he recognized that. He recognized the captivity. He recognized the condition that the walls are broken down, that the gates were burned to the city of Jerusalem. And he also, we said he got concerned. I want to tell you something. I like people that will get concerned. Not people that sit around the coffee shop and talk about it, but people that will do something, they get concerned. But then he had contrition. And the Bible said that he wept and he was broken and he mourned certain days. And then the Bible, and the interesting thing is, is that from verse 5 in chapter 1 to verse 11, how many's got your Bible with you? Say amen. amen. All right. If you ain't got a Bible with you, look on somebody that does. All right. And by the way, an old authorized version Bible. You know what? The, I like the authorized version. Got the authority on it. The authority of God. That's it. Now, he said, to, he said, so he called in prayer. Verses 5 through 11 is a man praying. One of the things we learn out of that is prayer, but we'll get a little bit more of that later. Then he confessed his own sin. He didn't blame it on everybody else. He said, I and my father have sinned. And then he had confidence that God was going to do something there in verse number 11. He had confidence in the Lord. We said last week, that he had a recognition of what was really going on in this world. And we need to have that. We need, the only way you can really recognize what's happening is through the Bible. If you want to know really what's going on in history in your time, read your Bible. But um, uh, he recognized some things. Can I tell you something? If you want to have revival in your own heart, <clears throat> you want to be a rebuilder, God, first place, the Bible said, examine me, O Lord. You need to learn how to look in your own heart and be honest with yourself. You know, if you lied this week, just be honest about it. You say, well, I don't think anybody knows. Well, God knows. You know, if you did something's wrong, just recognize it. Deal with it. Be honest about it. Behold, that is our truth in the inward parts. You're never going to have revival. You're never going to have the rejoicing of God, the power of God in your life till you get honest. And he was a man that recognized things and, and he took a good honest look at himself and his nation. Second thing he did was repent. And that means he turned from, he had a repentance of his sin and he had a desire to return to God. And repentance involves returning to the Lord and to his word. And then I like old Nehemiah because he was a man that not only recognized and repented and returned to God, but he rose up. He just didn't go down to the coffee shop like I said and talk about how bad things are. And he didn't sit around church and just talk about how bad things are. He recognized things were bad. But it's not enough to just recognize things are bad. It's it got to get up and do something about it. And that's what we're preaching through this book about. I want to encourage you to be a Nehemiah, to be a rebuilder, to be a reviver. Uh, don't just sit around talking how, well, I'll tell you what, can you believe what we seen on the news yesterday? Oh, my land, did you see what happened in Jefferson City? Did you see what happened in Washington, D.C.? And, you know, I don't tell you, you can do that until the Lord comes back. You ain't going to change nothing like that. You have to be a man who gets up and says, you know what, I'm going to do something first. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But then he, not only that was a man that rose up, but he, he was at a revival. He was quickened. When we're talking about revival, we're talking about quickened. Something happens to you. So I ain't sitting around no more. I'm going to do something for God. I'm going to be a rebuilder. I mean, I'm talking about quickened. I want to tell you, you get around God, you, you're going to get quickened. Quickened means you're being made alive. I'll tell you what, don't, don't talk to me. I don't like dead religion. I'll tell you what, I believe if God gets in you, somebody's living inside you, amen. And I'll tell you what, you want to do something, it's going to change your life. And that was what he was. And then he was a man who repaired things. We've got a lot of things that need to be repaired in this country. And then he was a man who rebuilt things. And he was a man who restored things and worship and so forth. And I say this, he was a man that was aware. He's a man that was aware. We need to be aware of what's going on. And I'll tell you what, the Bible said, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks. Know what's going on in your marriage. Know what's going on with your family. Know what's going on in your nation. Know what's going on in your community. Be aware. Have you got new neighbors that's moved in? Have you talked to them about the Lord? Uh, be aware of the spiritual condition of people around you. Then not only be aware, but he took action. He was a doer of the word and not a hearer only. And I want to again say to us that God's got plenty of churches where folks will just sit and listen and talk about how bad it is. But he doesn't have near enough churches where people say, I'll tell you, let's rise up, let's repair, let's rebuild, let's do something for God. And you can do that in, within yourself, all right? And I want to tell you something about, like about Nehemiah. I'll, I'll tell you, how many members, Brother Reuben Fields? Remember Reuben Fields? I know Reuben Fields, he was preaching up here and we had the pulpit up there and he's an old tall black man about that tall. He ain't a big old boy. And uh, his wife come with him. How many members, Reuben Fields' wife? 
All right. Now, Reuben Fields got up to preach one time here, and he said, oh, everybody raise your right hand. And everybody raised their right hand. He said, now, the reason I want you to raise your right hand, he said, because my wife's going to, uh, said, folks are going to ask me if y'all, if I moved you all while you was here. <laughs> and I want to be able to tell them I moved you. Back in the Psalms, there's a song that says, I shall not be moved. There's a song that says, I shall not be moved. Some folks' favorite song, I shall not be moved. <laughs> now, there's a right way and a wrong way to take that. There's some things you don't want to get moved from. You don't want to get moved from this book. You don't want to get moved from the faith. You don't want to get moved from righteousness. But I'll tell you what, Nehemiah was a man that got moved. You're going to find that very word. He said he was moved. Now, I'm going to tell you what, we need to come to church and get moved, amen. I'll tell you what, let God say, instead of sitting around talking about figuring out who we don't like and what we don't like about this, that, and the other, and having a, contempt, a contemptuous spirit, say, God, do something in my heart. Move me into prayer. Move me into Bible reading. Move me into soul winning. Move me into talking about Christ. Move me into loving people. Move me out of my selfishness. I'm dealing with the person right now. As a whole nine yards, there's nothing but a bunch of stinking selfishness, self-centered world. Move me out of my self-life. Move me into a Christ world. And he was a man that was moved. He took action. Well, he got motivated. And he had a mission and he had a mandate from God. So then chapter one, we got those seven, verse number seven through 11. They're recorded there, nothing but a prayer. Well, what's that tell you? If you're going to do something for God, if you're going to be a rebuilder, first thing you're going to need to be a person of prayer. Did you know something? That's every person in this building can be a person of prayer. He said, well, God hadn't called me in the mission field, and God hadn't called me to preach, and God hadn't called me this. I'm telling you something. God expects us all to pray. And I'm telling you right now, but I will say this, that, that if you're going to do anything for God, and you've got a vision for God to do something, you're going to have to saturate it in prayer first of all. And that prayer is a priority. And so he prayed. The Bible said in, in James chapter 5, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And the older I get, the more I want to pray, and the less I want to do other things. I'm telling you, God moves people through prayer. I'm going to tell you something. We, I, I believe in praying people under conviction. I believe that. And the old timers believe that. Oh, God, bring conviction on him. Let fall upon him, Lord, with old time Holy Ghost. Conviction of the Holy Ghost of God. Make him know he's a sinner headed to hell. You need that. How long has it been since you prayed like that? I'll tell you how. This, we, we're getting into this guy, but. The Bible said, but thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. When thou shut thy door, pray to thy father, which is in secret. And thy father, which is, seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. You ever get to where you believe in that and you start seeing some things of God? I'm going to be honest with you this morning. I'm not a great prayer, but I don't say everything this church does, everything in, in the ministry of God does has been through prayer. I'm so grateful that people that called said, Reggie, we're praying for you. Reggie, we're praying for you. I live upon prayer because I know something. Prayer's first. You've got to pray first before anything else. And that's what he did. I'm going to tell you, if you want to be a rebuilder, you want to be a repairer of the breach, you want to be a something used of God, do what this man did. Make prayer a priority in your life. And I know I'm redundant of going over last week, but the Bible said we ought to give ourselves to prayer. Christ prayed all night. The church prayed. And the Bible talks about the weapon of all prayer in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 20. Before anything and before everything, prayer. Saturate your life with prayer. Pray with the, prayer is the foundation of every work of God. Now, I want to say this to you. Would you do a work for God? The Bible said to pray for laborers. You know what, wonder what the church needs in America right now? We need laborers. We need people who work for God. And old, in that, Nehemiah was a man who's a work for God. I want to ask you, would you desire to serve the Lord? Do you have something in your heart that says, man, I want to do something to change the direction of this nation. I'd like to see this nation repaired and rebuilt with biblical principles. Then you're going to have to start praying. And it's through prayer that God will give you direction and God will give you power. You want to see your home spared from the flood of sin and iniquity coming in this country? You're going to have to pray. We need some fathers, some mothers, some citizens who recognize the walls of truth and righteousness are broken down. The gates are burned with lust and perversion. And they say, we want to rebuild this nation. Let me tell you something I'm, I'm looking for. I'm looking to change this nation. You, I, you say, Reggie, oh, I, I, I despise this mentality. Oh, we're just going to hover in the corner until Jesus comes back. I'll tell you, we ought to be attacking hell with a squirt gun. Amen. Let me tell you what I believe could happen in our day. Now, you listen to me. I believe this with all my heart. I believe we could see a time when sodomy laws are reestablished in this land where it was criminal act. You could be arrested for and prosecuted for being a sodomite. I believe we could see Roe versus Wade overturned in this nation. I believe that. We, that. That can happen. You say, well, I just don't think it happened. Well, that's why it ain't going to happen because you don't believe it will happen. 
I'm telling you something. We can elect enough officials that have some courage and some guts and some backbone to change these laws. And we can pray for God to turn the hearts of people. And we need to have big goals and big visions and turn it. Hey, we need to get back to where there's no faith taught in our public schools except Jesus Christ. There was a time when that was so in this country. But the walls are down, aren't they? The gates have been burned. And we're going to talk about a lot of things. But now let's get into chapter 2. That was just kind of an introduction chapter. But the last word in chapter 1, it says he was a, cut, he was a king's cupbearer. Now I'm going to talk about the character of a rebuilder here today for something, first, for this message. And, and I don't know, I hope this is for everybody, but it is for all of us actually. If you, if you exist, this is for you. But he's a, number one this morning, I want to talk about the fact that he was a cupbearer. What was a cupbearer? Now, you remember something. He had been taken captive out of the land of Israel, taken into Babylon. He was in the palace of Shushan, which is that old ancient city. And by the way, a lot of things in the Bible happened there at this, this place where he is at. We're going to go to Esther when we get down to the book of Nehemiah. Oh, my land, the book of Esther. You want to talk about, you, you want to picture how God's going to destroy Satan. Look at the book of Esther. But that's where that, they had a, they had a, a, a I've got to get off of that. He's a cupbearer. What's a cupbearer? A cupbearer was a man who brought the king's drinks to him. One of the greatest dangers that a king in that time had was to be poisoned. He ate nothing and he drunk nothing, but what a man standing in front of him ate at first. And if that man died or got sick, he knew he was being poisoned. That was one of the greatest ways to kill a leader in that day. Now, Nehemiah had been put in the position to be a cupbearer for the king. And that meant literally that he came in and they bought that wine before him or glass of water. It didn't make any difference. Nehemiah had to taste it and drink it first. And if it had poison, it to get him first and not the king. Now, I want you to imagine this morning how much trust. Now, watch this. How much trust must a king have in his cupbearer? You think about it. Now, I'm going to show you the secret to being a rebuilder for God to really use you. You, first of all, have got to be a cupbearer. You're going to have to be somebody people can trust. But not just people can trust. You're going to have to be a man that God can trust. I'm watching this over and over again. Let me tell you why people, well, I'm going to tell you something right now. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. And I've just about had my belly full of people who claim that they're going to do, want to do something for God and they won't even be faithful in their local church. Forget it. Forget it. Until you get faithful, God's not going to put his hand on you and use you. You mark it in your day book. God is looking for faithful people. That king had to have a man who was faithful. And I'm telling you what, he had a man who was willing to lay down his life for him. And it was a great position. Watch this. It was a great position of trust. If you're, watch, the, watch the pattern here. If you're going to be a rebuilder of marriage, the institution of the home and marriage, can, I tell you, can anybody tell me what's the greatest thing you'll have in your marriage? The heart, watch this, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her. Your marriage will break down if there's not trust. You do stuff to break the trust in your marriage, your marriage is shot. Just this week, I'm dealing with a situation where a, 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 a man, married young man, got to text in another married woman. blows me away because y'all know him. And now that woman is having trouble. So she's she's going she's to pay back by her not being trustworthy. And now the trust is all broken. Now the home is shot. I'm telling you the greatest thing you'll ever be. If you want to rebuild the walls of your marriage, the walls of American marriage, Christian people need to have trust. We need to be able to say you can trust me. You're going to be gone all week. You're going to be trust, you, you can trust me. I'm not going to be texting other women. I'm not going to be texting other men. I'm telling you, saying this is just real simple. Cornbread and beans, brown beans and potatoes preaching. But I'll tell you right now, Nehemiah will tell you how. If God, hey, don't ask his question. Hey, will God ever use you if, you if your wife can't trust you? Will God use you if your husband cannot trust you? Hey, young people, will God use you if your mom and daddy can't even trust you on Friday night?
going to rebuild, we're going to have to get back to being a people of trust. God can trust us. We're going to, do, we're going to trust us. And he's a cupbearer. If you're ever going to be used to God, you're going to have to be trustworthy. I'm going to tell you tonight, this morning, about God. You mark this down, you can trust him. You say, well, I tried to trust him. No, no, I'm going to tell you something. No, you haven't. I'm going to tell you right now, God don't lie to nobody. He never has, never has, never will. And I'm going to tell you, Joe, you know what Joe said? He tried, yay, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. See, if Joe Olsen will preach that one. Yea, though I get cancer, I will trust him. Yea, though my wife leaves me, I will trust him. Yea, though I go broke and bankrupt, I will trust him. That's what we need. We don't need this. Oh, God, you shut it out to me. You, you know what it, God is to most people in America's churches today? He's a casino. God's a casino. We go play the God slot machine. And if God don't do what I tell him to do, then I'm not going to trust him anymore because he's not trustworthy. Well, I'll tell you what trust is. Biblical trust is, is yea, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. If my business, no, if everybody quits me, if my business goes broke, I mean, I lose it all. If the tornado wipes me out, I still will trust him. Amen. And I want to tell you something, you can trust him. You can trust him, amen. Now I want you to know this next thing. If you're going to be a rebuilder, well, I'll just get on that. But the truth about it is that cupbearer had a very dangerous job and a very precarious job is a job of trust. He's a cupbearer. Number two, <clears throat> look what it says there. And it came to pass, verse number one, chapter two, in the month Nisan, the 20th year, our taxes, the king, that wine was before him. I took up the wine, gave it to the king. Now watch this statement. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! I had not been before time sad in his presence. Oh, say, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. I want to tell you something. Now, this bothers me. Just yesterday, I dealt with it, or the day before, I forget now. Again, it's just whining, complaining. I live in America. That's terrible. I've got a roof over my head. It's terrible. I've got food in the refrigerator. It's rotten. Oh, everything's terrible. Oh, that life is rotten in America. I'm going to tell you something right now. I guarantee you, if you want to do something, take a mission trip to the Philippines. I don't care where you want to go. Go to Africa. You do what you want to. But those people are happier than you are. And they're living in thatched huts. <clears throat> I never heard singing like I heard in the Philippines. Going down through cardboard homes, cardboard. They build them out of cardboard boxes, and you, and you pick them up and take them to church, and they just sing. They sing all the way to church, sing at church, and all the way back home to church. Happy, 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 smiling from ear to ear, big old white teeth, smiling. And I looked at him. I said, "Don't you know your kids are poor? Don't you know the world owes you a living? Don't you know you're a victim?" You shouldn't be smiling like this. Don't you want to be like us Americans? Don't you want to be depressed? <laughs> I'm tell you what, I've had my belly full of it. I'm honest with you. Do you say, Rez, do you get down? Yeah, I get down. Do you get feeling sorry for yourself sometimes? Yeah, I do once in a while. But I'm going to tell you something. We ought to be the most happiest people in the world. Amen. Most joy in the world. Now, here's what the deal was. Now, you watch this. <clears throat> How many knows that if your kid whines every day, you get to where you don't pay attention to it? By the way, don't let your kid whine. Whoop them for whining. Yep. Just jerk them up and say, I'll tell you what, if, that, if you're sad now, you wait. We're gonna, we're, you're going to have so much work. You ain't even seen sad yet. That's going to make you sad. I'll tell you what my mama used to do. If, if, you know what my mama do? If we get to fussing and going on, or she, 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 go to the garden. And I'm telling you, she had a garden. I ain't joking. You're twice as big as this building. I'm not. You think I'm kidding you? I'm not. I can show it to you. It's right. I walk. I can walk from corner to corner of it. To this day. And her her deal was, you ain't gonna straighten up. You gonna you gonna pick four rows of green beans, put weeds out of them. And you know how you did that? You didn't do this. If you did this, whoa, you was about to get a whooping. You did this. You got down to where the weeds was at. And worse than that, you didn't pop the tops off of the weeds. You pulled them out by the roots. And she checked you out. 
Mean mother, wasn't she? Mean mama. And so that's why I'm so down today. I, it, was, it was my childhood. It was my raising. That's stupid. I'm happy about it. I'm glad I was raised in the country. I'm glad I was raised in a garden. I'll tell you, I'm glad I'm saved. I'm glad I've got Christ. I'm telling you, if you want to be used for God, get that stinking, grappy, whiny, complaining look off your face. Oh, I'd like to have been an army sergeant. Smile at me. <laughs> I wouldn't have made a very good army sergeant. Hey, what's the deal with this? Why can't we Americans smile? And I'm going to tell you a little something. You know what? If he'd have been whining all the time, that he would have never got what done what he did. Because he walked in there one day and the king says, what's wrong with this guy? He got a sad countenance. Are you listening to me? He had not been sad at that time. He said, something wrong. Now I want to encourage you. Now I'm not trying to be honorary. I'm saying this to you, to myself, before I say it to you. Reggie Kelly has no reason to gripe. I have no reason to be walking around with a sad countenance and act like the world's all falling apart on me. I've just about had my belly full of young people in America just walking around the snarly, sn- act like that, you know, they lost their last cat or something. I don't know what. You ought to rejoice when, anyway. I'm just saying, hey, go ahead. Go ahead and sit there with this. You, God will never use you. He'll just say, I, I can't use him. He's a whiner. I can't use him. He's always got a sullen look on his face. I can't use him. Oh, there's a kid. Happy with what he's got. Thankful. Has good, always has a good attitude. I use him. There's nobody in this church house. Like, if, you want to be, if you're not interested in being a rebuilder, you're not interested in doing something for God in your life, not interested in having a blessed life, then don't pay attention to this message. Just go ahead and sulk your way through the rest of your life. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't, I don't like being around that stuff. I know life gets tough. I know there's times. But let me tell you something about this man. Well, anyway, he, he noticed. He, he prayed, but, and then let's, let's do this. Let's continue on. He said, this is, he said, this is sorrow of heart. That's what the king said. Then I was so afraid. And verse number three, the king, he, he said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father, sepulchers lies waste and the gates there ever consume with fire? Then the king said unto me, for what dost thou make request? Now, Wednesday night we talked about this. Watch what he does. Now, watch what he does. Boom, he prays. The king asked him a question. The king said, hey, countenance ain't right. Something's wrong with this guy. It's serious. He don't usually act like this. Now, there's got to be. Here's the deal. If you will have a cheerful, honestly cheerful countenance and, and, a, and a buoyant spirit and be enthused about life, when it comes time when you really do need to be sad, it will count for something. If he'd have been walking there every day with this. But when he came in and some, his king said, there's something wrong. This guy's got a sorrowful heart. And he said, what's the problem, Nehemiah? Nehemiah told him. And the king says, what are you going to do about it? And old Nehemiah shot a flare prayer. He didn't do anything without praying. You know, be a rebuilder, learn to pray about everything. Well, he said there in verse number five, and I said unto the king, if it pleased the king, if thy servant had found favor in thy sight, that thou would send me. <clears throat> Circle that in your Bible. He didn't say, would you send some fellers over here to Judah? <laughs> Would you send somebody else, Lord? He said, send me. In fact, you're going to say that twice. Send me unto Judah, unto the house of my fathers, that I may build it. Circle, that I may build it. Not somebody else build it, that I may build it. You want to be a builder? You want to be a rebuilder? You want to do something for God? Say, God, send me. Give me the grace. I'll do it. Now, I'm going to tell you something about Nehemiah. Now, watch this very carefully. I had a man say to me one time, how many knows that... I have a very hard shell exterior, right? Come across crude, unloving, unkind, you know, and I'm the kind, you know, when you fall down, well, get up, let's go. And those of you who are the kind to go over and say, oh, let me help you up, you know, and (laughs) you, you don't like my kind and I don't care for your kind. Because to me, see, so you're, you're going to make a sissy out of the boy. You're going to go down and pet him till he's, you know, till he thinks you're going to be petted every time he falls down. Make him get up and go. Okay, that's kind of the way I'm cut, okay? But at the same time, I, you know, I did like for my mama to pat my forehead when I was sick. There's a place for all of it, and we all need to balance out. It doesn't mean I'm, I'm not right about my coarseness. But there's also, how many know there's a very soft side to my heart? Very soft side. I mean, I'm telling you what, I mean, there's, I, there's a tenderness in my heart. And I thank God for it. But a man said one time, said, don't be crying. You know, something like, 
I'm like, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute. If I remember right, my Lord wept. And I'm going to tell you something about this man right here. Don't you ever underestimate a man who weeps. Nehemiah wept. But Nehemiah was tough as a hickory sprout. Now, I want to give you a great truth here today. Be tough as you want to be, but don't ever get to where you can't weep. Have a tender heart to weep. If you want to be a rebuilder, you're going to have to have some compassion. He wept, but he was also tough. Learn this from him. Don't be just one or the other. Be willing to weep with those that weep. Be willing to mourn. And we ought to mourn over the condition of our country. We ought to mourn over things that go on, maybe in our families, whatever. But at the same time, we have to be tough. He said that I may build it. You want to tell you something. Another thing about Nehemiah, you want to be a builder, not a tear downer. Isn't that good English? <clears throat> Old Reuben, old Reuben Fields said this. He said, I was a little 12-year-old black boy down in Louisiana working in fields. And he said, one day I looked up and I said, Lord, I'd like to help you in your work. I'd like to, 12 years old. He said, Lord, I'd like to help you in your work. Very simple prayer. God answered that prayer. Used him mightily. Still using him. He, though he be dead, he's speaking. And I want to tell you something. Be a builder. And you know what you ought to do while you're sitting in this church house this morning is just whisper a prayer to the Lord. God, would you help me? Lord, he builds this church, but Lord, would you let me help you? Could I be a helper? That's a prayer you ought to pray today. Let's go on down through the river and read, read and just see the things that he did. Verse number six, the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me. And I set him a time. Verse 7, moreover, I said unto the king, if it please the king, let letters be given unto the governors beyond the river that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's force, that he may give me timber and make beams for the gates of the palace, which appertain to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Verse number seven, then I came to governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. And now the king had sent captains of the army and the horsemen with me. Now there's some things there we need to get a hold of. And I'm sure many of you have already seen it. Not only did he want to build and help God in his work, but uh, he asked God to give him favor in the sight of this man. And now there's something he did. He said, let letters. You're going to see the, that word letters is in verse number seven. It's in verse number eight. It's in verse number nine. Three times he mentions letters. Now, let me give you something here. <clears throat> if you're going to be a builder in the spiritual realm of this country, whether it's in your home, your marriage, your business, the political scene of this country, doesn't matter. You're going to have to learn to work through authority. Amen. This is one of the biggest secrets in the book of Nehemiah. Many men would have got it in their head to go to Jerusalem and rebuild the gates but they would have secretly tried to do it without working through the king. Never, ever try to do a work of God without being under the authority of God's word. I'm going to put a scenario out to you today. I'm going to do two different things. God sets up authority structure in this world. Okay, God is over everything. Then God ordained first the home. And in that home, there's a husband and a wife, and parents, and there's children. God ordained the second thing he ordained was government, okay? And, and God put limitations on that government. And then God ordained the church, okay? And those are the three structures of authority in the Bible. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you want God with you and you want God's hand on you in your rebuilding work, whatever realm of life it is in, you better be sure you're under the authority of God. Now, we're seeing things go on in this nation. It's very critical to this. But let's just go with something for a minute. You got your father and your, you got your dad and your mom. You cannot have a rebellious spirit against your mother and your father and expect God to bless what you're doing, even if it is for the Lord. You have to work through God-ordained authority. One of the toughest areas I've had in this church is staying. I want to tell you right now, I have no business as a pastor ever subverting the authority of a, mother, a father and a mother in this church. One of the reasons that I do not have a lot of youth programs because most youth programs subvert the authority of mom and dad. They are taught things, done things with, 
that they probably wouldn't have done if mom and dad had been there. No preacher has any business subverting the authority of a mother and a father. And if I subvert, and you wonder sometimes why ministries wash out and why the fruit of it's not very good is because it's out from underneath authority. I'm going to go further. A father, a father who is not under the authority of God's word is going to have all kinds of problems. You cannot expect, hey daddies, you cannot expect your children to do right if you're not obedient to the word of God yourself. And then let's bounce it right on down. A wife is to be in submission to her husband. And mama, I'm going to tell you something. You, you want your daughter to do right. You want your son to do right. But you're rebelling against your dad all the time, your, th their daddy all the time. You're rebelling against God-ordained authority. And you kids, here's mom and dad, and you're saying, well, I'm not going to mind them. I'm going to go do what I want to do. I'm telling you right now, you mark it down your day book. This Bible teaches that God will bless that man who works through authority. Now, let's move it into another realm. Into the, you have another authority in this land. It's called the Constitution. And let me tell you something right now. That constitution, as far as human law, is the supreme law of this land. And anything that violates that constitution is not a legal law. Amen. <clears throat> That's why Roe versus Wade is not... By the way, Roe versus Wade did not pass in any kind of legislation. It was done by a bunch of judges. It's an illegal law. Does not our Constitution say that we have the right to, liberty, to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness? That, the Roe versus Wade, abortion is a violation of that constitutional law of the right to life. That's why those that are against abortion call it a right to life groups. Because that's a constitutional issue. And here's the challenge that we need to, to rebuild our country is that we have got to, I'm going to tell you one of the, you ought to get on a crusade. And that's to reestablish the Constitution as the supreme law of this land. Now let me tell you where I'm coming with this. I want to give you a scenario today. Let's say that uh, Bill. Bill, would you come here just a second and help me preach just a little bit today? <clears throat> Bill is, uh, let's say he's up at Seymour. He lives near Seymour. And he, he said, I'm going to go just have a seat right there, Bill. And, and put your hands up like you're driving your car. Okay. He's driving a car. And, and I'm, I'm a, a <laughs> what'd somebody say? No, don't pay attention to him, Bill. It's all right, okay? Bill's driving, and, and so he gets up and turns off 60 Highway, starts coming down into downtown Seymour, and lo and behold, there's a, there's a uh, insurance check. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And uh, they're having the uh, police, or come, police have got it, they're stopping everybody, right? And you come through, and they want to see your driver's license, and they want to make sure you've got your insurance card. Is that correct? All right, now watch this. So Bill pulls up. <clears throat> Let me get on this side. Bill, would you come over here and sit on this? I'm, I'm going to be the officer. And Bill, and Bill rolls his window down. He's pulled it now. I'm going to take, now, keep in mind, Bill has not been speeding. Bill has not been doing anything in violation of the law. He has just pulled through a law enforcement check. So Bill pulls up, and he rolls his window down. And I say, how you doing today? We're having an insurance license. Need to see your license, sir. And so I like that. So he's getting his license out. And I look over on his seat, and he's got an AK-47 over in his seat. <clears throat> and then plus that, he's got a 9mm on his belt. And I say to Bill, <clears throat> sir, you need to give me your, your guns while this is going on. Tell me what just happened. Tell me what happened. I just broke the law. I just violated his constitutional rights. I am not above that constitution. That constitution guarantees him the right to bear arms. So now what if I say, and he says... Sir, I don't have any problem with you checking my insurance, my license, but I do have a problem with you trying to take my arms. And I say, I don't care what you think. You're dis Watch this now. You're disobeying. This is what they'll say. You are disobeying a lawful order. It's not an awful lawful order. I have no right to take his arms. There's no justification for me to take his arms. Now, I want to tell you something right now. <clears throat> The, people, the liberals in this country 
it's not your constitution thereafter so much as it is your Bible thereafter. Now, I'm going to tell you why. Because your constitution tells them that you have the freedom to worship and the freedom to assemble and all these freedoms to bear arms. And, and, the, and what, listen to me, the freedom to speech. You know what all this safe space stuff is about? It's attacking the First Amendment. Yeah. And that you don't have a right to say, you know something, I may disagree with what you say, but you have a right to say it. And I'm going to tell you another phrase that we better wake up to, and that's hate speech. I want to tell you what you say is not a crime. That's tyranny. And right now there are jurisdictions that are making laws against hate speech. Well, not, and now all of a sudden we're in a new arena because Jeremy, who decides what hate speech is? Jeremy says to me, I, I love mushrooms. And I say, I believe that's hate speech. See, that's just how stupid and ludicrous it is. But he, but he could say something I could say, well, that's hate speech. Jer Jer Jeremy could say, well, them stupid farmers. That's hate speech. I knew it was my safe space. You're microaggressing me. And you're macroaggressive to me. And this whole thing is an attack on our Constitution. And I'm telling you, they have got sledgehammers out, beating the bricks out of our Constitution, brick by brick by brick. And I'm going to tell you something. You can take it from me and call me if you need me. But if a police officer ever tells you to surrender your firearms and he has no cause to do that, he's in the wrong. And I'll come to your defense myself. You don't have, I don't have a right to tell you to surrender your firearm. The Constitution tells you you have a right to bear arms. It'll be your Bibles next. That's where we're headed. They're not going just after your talk. They're not, they are. They're not just, let me tell you, they're not, it's, not, it's not about your guns. It's about your faith. Because let me tell you where we're headed. We are headed to, if we don't stop this train and we don't rebuild and the broken down walls and rebuild the burned out gates, we're going to see a time when they're going to tell you what you can preach and what you can't preach. What you can believe, what you can't believe, what you can share with people in the gospel, what you can. Right now, there are municipalities where if you go into the street corner and you've, I'm sure you've seen some of them. You go there and you preach, you hand out tracts, you hold up a sign against abortion. They'll attack you and I'll tell they'll arrest you, throw you in jail. It's happening in these east and west coast cities. I'm telling you something. This is not a game. Whether we like it or not, folks, we're not living in the 1960s and 50s America. Our freedoms are being attacked. And the final deal is just what she said. It's this book right here. And that's what, that's what Satan's after. Now, I, I just don't really care who likes this or don't like this, okay? I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an attorney. But I, I'm going to tell you something. Our Constitution, was this Bible was not written for lawyers. Amen? And that constitution was not written for lawyers. It was written for the common man. And if that police grabs you, starts throwing you out of the car, throwing you on the ground stuff, that policeman ought to be thrown off, ought to be fired, and he ought to be prosecuted. And there's nobody in here more in favor of law enforcement and supportive than I am. But I'm telling you something. Here's why I say I personally, and, I, and this is live and this is recorded. I sat in the Mountain Grove uh, City Hall meeting where the mayor, city administrator, and chief of police sat. And I asked them this question because they did this. And I asked them a question. I said, if Obama, Obama was president at the time, if he sent you an order down here and ordered you to confiscate all the guns in, in Mountain Grove, the city, would you do it? And the chief of police said, yes, without hesitation. And I stood up and I said, I'm done. You've just lost me. And the mayor said he had an AK-47 and he had 200 rounds and he would hand it in. They wouldn't have to take it from him. And I don't care if they hear this because they've already heard it from me. I left. I said, you've lost me and you're exactly on. In fact, I did. Now, I've got a constitution with me right here. I, I took, I, I laid it in front. You know what they did? You know what the chief police did? He went, throwed it back at me. I said, I don't care what the constitution says. Now, I'm your pastor. And I love you. And I love your freedom. 
I want, you to be, I want your grandkids to be able to worship God in spirit and truth. And Nehemiah was a man who understood this stuff, and he worked through authority. Now, that's what I'm saying is here, you can't be a rebel. Let me tell you why Antifa and that stuff's not going to work, because they're not working underneath the authority of the Constitution. But we have to hold that authority, and we have to hold all these people's feet to the fire. And every time they violate the Constitution, point it out, point it out, point it out, and use that Constitution. Use that Bible. It is the authority. Bill, I appreciate it. I'm not going to drag you out of the car and throw you on the ground, okay? I appreciate it. But that's, but that's going on. Hey, that's going on in this country. People who haven't done anything, good citizens, haven't broke the law, haven't done anything. Trying to make them think that they have to surrender their arms. It's not right. Well, let's kick on down chapter two there. So here, the next thing in the, in the order of things there, one you get is that he worked through authority. He got letters from the king to go do what he was doing. Now, let me say something that liberals understand that we conservatives don't. And here's why. It's not because we're dumb. It's because of most of American history, we've assumed that the law was on our side. Now, what they understand is that, that they could, and here's what they're doing. They're working through sections of authority. They don't necessarily represent the Constitution, but they'll work through attorneys. They'll work through, they'll work through judges. They'll work through this, any way to get it done. And they understand something. See, in the 60s, they tried the rebellion. That didn't work. I don't know if I lived through that. I know what I'm talking about. And the riots in the streets and the marches and all that kind of stuff. And down with the establishment. Well, it didn't work. So now, Hillary Clinton is a classic example of that. Hillary Clinton was a hip, was in the hip, her and Bill was in the hippie movement. And they realized finally that you're going to have to work through the system if you're ever going to change it, if you're going to get what they wanted. We have to understand that we cannot be rebels either. Don't do stuff that's not legal. And, you know, I could preach on this for a while, but I'm just saying this, that learn how Nehemiah understood something, that God works through authority. And I want to tell you another thing. God works through bad authority. You don't have to have a saved judge for God to work through, us, through that judge. God worked through Nebuchadnezzar. He worked through uh, Belshazzar. He worked through horrible authorities. And uh, just, just know that God can turn the heart of the king, okay, and just have, it takes faith to believe that I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to do what's legal. I'm going to do what's, what needs to be done. I'm, I'm not going to be a rebel. I'm not going to work outside authority. And so, anyway, work through authority. And then, uh, his, as I want, another thing I want to say again, he had a good attitude. All right? He had a good attitude, good countenance. Now, verse number, and I heard somebody say amen when this happened. But if you look at verse number 8, look at the last sentence in verse number 8. It says, according to the good hand of my God upon me. Can I tell you something? We just need an old-fashioned revival of getting the good hand of God upon us. Amen. You know something? I'm not, I'm not nothing. I'm telling you right now, I'm just, the older I get, to re, I just, but God is, I told Karen this week, you know, I'm not a good pastor. You can be sick and I want, you know, I, you know, I just hope you don't die. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a good pastor. I don't, I don't have a big bucket full of compassion, but I do have a compassionate care. I want people to be saved. I mean, what if you gain the whole world and lose your own soul? I want you to be saved. Okay? But God, the calling of my life is to preach the Word of God, to teach the Word of God, to publish the Word of God, to get the Bible out in, in, in the region. That's, that's, that's my calling. Okay? And, and I'm going to tell you this, something I've known. So we've got to have God's good hand upon us. If the Lord isn't with us, we ain't got nothing. They don't care what you do. And I want to encourage you today, get God's good hand. By the way, that's in verse 18 and in verse 8, both. He tells that twice. Now, here's what we're going to get down to verse number 10. Look at verse number 10. Everybody there say amen. Everybody still awake this morning? Amen. When Sanballat, underline his sorry low-down name, the Horonite and Tobiah, underline that rascal's name, the servant, the Ammonite, heard of it. It grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. And it still does. Now, here's what you're going to If you're going to be a rebuilder, you're going to have to have a good countenance. You're going to have to be a man of prayer. You're going to have to be a man who works under authority. And you're going to have to expect opposition. Now, I'm so stupid that when I started preaching, and uh, <laughs> you ain't had fun until you've preached a revival meeting, and you're up there preaching going, I'll tell you something else. This sorry low down your daughter's cheerleading and running around there pom-pom deals on showing their panties to everybody in the crowd. That's sorry low down. And three deacons got daughters on the cheerleading and they're going. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that God's people would be glad. 
when you preached on sin. I thought God's people be glad when you preached against abortion. I thought God's people, I found out that ain't so. And I mean, people get madder than a hornet at you. Hate your guts. And I'll tell you, they find out you're trying to, we ain't never done it that way around here and we ain't starting now. Bless God, I was here when you got here and I'll be here when you're gone. And I'm telling you something. If you're going to be a rebuilder, you get ready for people to oppose you, to hate your guts. And a man's foes will be they of his own household. That's right. Now, you're not going to be, you know, and you know why, you know why most people don't, they want to get to rebuilding business? Because they know it's going to cost them friends. Can I tell you something? As long as you're going to be the old good buddy of everybody out here, you just forget it because you ain't going to build nothing. As long as you want to be proper with all your buddies. Can I tell you, every, I want to tell every 15-year-old, to 14-year-old, to 30-year-old, 35-year-old boy in this young man, man in this church house, you ain't going to be worth a plug nickel to God until you're willing to lose every friend you've got for God. That's right. You say, well, I'll have friends. I like friends too, but I'm going to tell you what. If you stand for righteousness, you're going to rebuild the walls. You're going to take a stand. You're going to lose friends. And you're going to have opposition. And they're going to talk about you and they're going to demonize you. Do you know what they said about your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? He has a devil. They'll accuse you of being demon infested just because you tell the truth. I'll tell you something. When, whenever I, and by the way, that's to me, that's what this whole church has been about. It's just trying to rebuild the walls. And you talk about opposition. And I thought we ought to rebuild the walls of education. I thought we ought to quit letting the world educate our kids. Talk about opposition. So you need to expect it. If you're going to be a rebuilder, expect opposition. That's in verse number 10. I want you to watch the deeper part of this man in verse number 11. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Three is the number of resurrections, number of deity in the Bible. I rose in the night and some few men with me. Now, you ever heard that statement? Where'd you hear? Who talks about just a few men? The Marines, right? There's a principle they understand, be honest with you. They understand that you're not going to have a huge group of people that's really going to stand with you. And Nehemiah understood that. He said, I had a few good men. By the way, God has always blessed me in this church. I've had good men. I, the, one of my prayers, I pray every week, probably five, six times a week. Lord, give me men who love you, who love their wives, who love this book. I ask God to send me men like that. I want a few good men that will stand with me in the storm. He said, he said, there's a few good men. With, he said, a few men with me. Neither had I told any man what my God had put in my heart to do. Now, I want to tell you something. There's a joyful thing when God puts something in your heart to do. Okay. At Jerusalem, neither was any beast with me, save the beast I rode upon. Now watch this, verse 13. I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well. Woo, you, when you see the word dragon in the Bible, you better watch out what's going on. Can you imagine something called a dragon well? Now you know what the next place was, a dung gate. You know what he's looking at, folks? He's looking at the demon-infested situation. Dung well speaks of that pit from out which the demonic powers come from that are destroying us. That's your drug culture, your liquor culture. I mean, tell you what, you go in half the churches in America right now and preach on drinking Bud Light and they'll get ticked off at you. You can't even preach on nakedness in the average church in America. They'll get ticked at you. That's how bad the walls are broken down. I'll tell you what your granddaddy did. Your granddaddy would think he was a stinking coward preacher if you didn't preach on it. Then your granddad would have said, he ain't worth a flip. Get, let's get rid of him. He ain't preaching on nothing. He ain't going to do our homes and families no good. But we got, we, we got all buddied up with the world. And now we detect if they preach on something. But he went down here to check things out. That dragon well and that dung gate. Well, you know what a dung gate is. That's the, that's the, that's the, 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 the filth, off scaring filth. And what he's saying here to you is, he said, I went down and checked this thing out. And he said, I'll tell you what, a demon infested, dragon satanically controlled area full of filth. And if that don't describe America, I'll, I'll eat your dirty socks. This country's perverted. Isn't it a shame what we've got in the situation with the Missouri governor? Is that not perversion? And I can promise you that's the tip of the iceberg. It's all over our country everywhere. You poor girls, I feel sorry for you girls. 
being raised in such a perverted society. Girls, I'm going to tell you something. It's going to take some real diligence for you to find a man who loves God and do right by you. You better look that, you better look that bozo straight in the eyeballs and ask, ask him if he watches pornography or not. You better ask him if he's willing to hand his phone over to you and have it checked to see if he's watching pornography or not. I'm wanting to preach on some stuff, but I'm just going to leave it there. But he went down and checked out the filth and the demonic powers that was controlling that area. And he said, and viewed again the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates there was consumed with fire. And by the way, those gates, just think about this. We'll get into this later in the book of Nehemiah. I'm about done. Gates to your soul is your eyes and your ears, your mouth and so forth, your hearing and so forth, smelling. Those are gates to your soul. Burned. We're, we're burned in this country. Burned lust, burn, burn, burning lust. Romans chapter 1. Verse 14, then I went to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool. Now we're going to get in priest maybe next Sunday on the 10 gates. There's 10 gates that are going to rebuild and every gate has a, has a specific area of life to deal with within the church in your life. In the king's pool, there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Verse 15, then I went up by the night and broke, viewed the wall and turned back, entered by the gate of the valley. Boy, that's, a, that's, a, that's an amazing gate. And the rulers knew not whither I went and what I did, neither as yet as I told it to the Jews, nor to the priests, nor to the nobles, nor the rulers, nor the rest that did the work. That tells you something here. He surveyed the situation. He made sure he knew what was going on without unfilled, un, untainted by other people's opinions and ideas. He went to look for it himself. Now you get to verse 17. Here's a great thing. Then I said unto them, ye see, who's he talking about? These men, these few men. You see the distress that we're in, how Jerusalem lieth waste. The gates are burned with fire. Come and let us build the wall of Jerusalem that would be no more reproach. And then I told them of the, good, of the hand of my God, which is good upon me. And also the king's word that is spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. And I was going to say something to you. If you, if you want to be a rebuilder, learn to, learn to let God use you to inspire people. To inspire people. We need people that can inspire people to good work. We need people who've got some enthusiasm. How many's ever, and I know I probably, not, but there's a book called um, Band of Soldiers, Stephen Ambrose. It's a true story about the 101st Airborne, World War II. There's a man in there by the name of Dick Winters. He's a, he, he died here about two or three years ago. Dick Winters uh, was a leader. And uh, Dick Winters was kind of man, and, and, and I've watched him being interviewed on, on some film clips and I've, I've, I've watched the men that were under him talk about him. And to a man, those men, old men would say, if he said, if he called me up and wanted me to go in battle with him today, I'd go with him. He inspired us. He made us want to win. He made us believe we could win. And he didn't ever ask us to do something he wouldn't do himself. And what makes victories like that is inspiration. Can I tell you something? We all need inspiration. And here's what hurts my heart. Our textbooks and the history, they're rewriting history now, making out George Washington. And the other day, a statue of Thomas Jefferson was marked up and spit on and thrown filth on. You know, and they're taking men that have been inspiration to the greatest freedom of this world's ever known. And they want to destroy it. Why do they want to do that? Because they are destroying inspiration. And I want, to, I want to encourage you about something today. Learn to be an inspire. Inspire your wife. I know it might be hard. Inspire your family. Let's live for God. God's good hand is upon us. Let's do this. Let's stand for righteousness. Be inspired. Let me tell you something. David had to encourage himself in the Lord, the Bible said. And you're going to have to learn. Somebody's going to have to get inspired. And you've got to be able to inspire other people. Let's don't lose the inspiration. God wants us to have inspiration. I don't think I'm getting this across. Somehow or another, I just, I'm like, everybody's looking at me going, you know, I, this, is, this is serious business. This is serious business. We're living in a day lacking inspiration. It's just like we're all going to endure till Jesus comes. But we're not going to do anything. We need inspiration. 
I can, I'm not doing any good. I'm, I, I can just tell. It's like, it's like, man, I don't know. I'm wanting to, but I am not. Verse number 19, Then Sambalet the Horite and Tobiah the servant, and Ammonite, and guess whom the Arabian hurt. And by the way, you look at those names and find out who those people are, the Ammonites, the Arabians. Now here's what the deal is. <clears throat> they heard it, they did something. Number one, they laughed us to scorn. <laughs> you don't drink? You don't smoke marijuana? You don't like Beyonce? You don't like Madonna? <laughs> what are you a nut? What are you wearing that dress for? Are you a nun? <laughs> I'm going to tell you right now. If you are going to be a rebuilder for God, you get ready to get laughed at and laughed to scorn. They laughed him to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you will do? Will ye rebel against the king? And you, know what's, you talk about a big old lie straight out of the bowels of hell. That man had not rebelled against the king. He had actually worked through authorities and obtained letters from the king to do what he was doing. And they were turning around and they were lying out their teeth. And you better get ready for this. They're not only going to laugh at you and scorn you for your stand for Jesus Christ. But they're going to lie about your stand for Jesus Christ. They're going to demonize you and make you out to be a rebel when the truth about it is you're just trying to obey the word of God. Yeah. Let's stand. I had a cousin one time told me, he said, Reggie, you're too intense. You're too serious. You need to lighten up a little. I can't preach this book without being intense. To me, if I'm, not, if I'm going to get up here, and, and I know I may do a floppy job of it, but I'm going to tell you something. I want every home in this church house built upon the Word of God. I want the repairing, the restoring, the rebuilding. I, I don't want your kids swept out. I don't want to see your great-grandkids a bunch of sodomites. And I'm telling you right now, we're in a generation, if we don't rebuild the walls of truth, the walls of righteousness, the walls of honesty, the world will get us. Because the wall's down, the gate's broke. And the idea, and whether you like it or not, understand it, the whole, one of the whole ideas of a church is, is the church is to have the walls and the gates that separate us from the world. We go out into the world, but we have a, there's a wall. And there's some things don't come inside our house. We're going to preach on this. What's inside the wall? And God wants to save your family. That's the whole idea. I feel like I've kind of messed things up this morning. But anyway, I love you. Tonight I'll be picking back up in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And we're going to be discussing things that cause Christians to be divided. Things that cause Christians, well-meaning Christians, to be divided. Hope you'll be here tonight for that. First Corinthians, preaching through the book of 1 Corinthians. Do pray for those, as Zachary said, who've lost things in the tornado. And for Sister Denise, pray for my mom. She's in the hospital still. And I uh, just want you to know I love you. Lord, thank you for this day. I pray, Lord, that I've not said anything that you didn't want said. I pray, God, I've said everything you wanted said. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will put into the heart of every family, every individual here, to be a rebuilder, to be a repairer of the breach, to build up the gates. And, Lord, I pray, that we may, Lord, put a wall between us and this world that would destroy us. God, I pray, help it to be so. Lord, I know for a fact there's a lot of mom and dads in this church house. That's been, that's, they've been their dream and desire is to rebuild the old waste places. Raise a family for God. God bless them. Answer their prayers and hear the cry of their hearts. And Lord, I pray unto the generations till Jesus comes. May the work that we're doing here be a lasting work in the hearts of people. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We love you. We'll see you tonight. Be careful on the road.